Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Tom Turnbull, the visual effects supervisor for Wednesday on Netflix. Tom, what were your thoughts about working with Tim Burton on this project? And what were those initial conversations like in terms of the expectations for you and, and what you could bring to the series? Well, what were my initial thoughts? I mean, I, I was a bit apprehensive um, because obviously Tim has got this enormous body of work and is an iconic director. Um, I was pretty nervous because I, I, I knew I, I had to, he had to prove me. There's no way I was doing the show without him approving me. And um, I did one interview with him. Uh, it was quite short. And pretty much the only thing he asked of me was that we made sure that thing would be derived from an actor's performance. Mm. Which is great, because that's what I wanted to do anyway. I, mean, I, I think that, you know, if you, if you go back on the history of thing, that's how he has been done in the past. And, you know, it worked. Why break it? So you that was... And you had worked with Miles Miller and Al Goff before, right? So was that sort of your connection? That was my connection, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I've done enough with them that there's a pretty big comfort zone there. Uh, we work well together. There's a lot of trust, so that that helped a lot. Tim Tim was brand new to, to me and also was brand new to Miles and Al. So that was... That, that was the, the nervous part, but honestly, it, it worked out really well. Um, you know, I found Tim quite quite easy to work with um, because he just has so much experience. He's he's got so much clarity about what he wants, and it's very you know, just listen to what he says. It's going to work out. Um, you mentioned this. One of the most beloved Adams Family characters is, of course, Thing. Can you talk about you know what you did to create that character and make him appear as though he's this hand like pet always running around he has such personality for something that doesn't really speak so what went into that uh well a lot went into that <laughs> um and it, and it was again that was one of the reasons i wanted to do the show i wanted to be able to be you know part of that kind of creation of a, of a character or recreation um so i i was um involved very early on in that um I uh, was involved in the casting, which is very unusual for visual effects to be involved in casting. It doesn't ha happen much. Um, so, and it, the, then I found out that really means watching hundreds of tapes of people trying to do things and choosing which, which one is, is the best. And then we, we narrowed it down to three three candidates uh, that Tim interviewed, uh, who brought them in, personally talked to them all. Turned out they were all magicians. Wow. Um, if you if you know anything about uh, the earlier. Adams movies from the 90s, Christopher Hart, who, who played the thing, he was also a magician. Um, so we didn't go out looking for magicians, but that's just how it worked out. Uh, they seemed to be the ones that were able to do the hand performance best and understood. I, I think what it is is they understood that what, you know, what they do in, in magic is misdirection and, you know, just sort of creating illusions and that's really what thing is about um he, he doesn't work like a normal actor would work so anyway after we cast him we did go ahead and um uh victor uh, who, who did the part uh, had never acted before so we we kind of put him through boot camp and we started bringing him in and workshopping with him uh, with you know, visual effects, we did uh, we did a test shoot with them so you could get a feeling of what it's like to be on, on set. We did a um, countless videos of him performing different scenes, um, and we we put weeks in, of work into that, and just sort of getting Victor to the point where you know he would he would have the best chance of of success because really his first day of performance was on set was working with Tim Burton and and Jenna Ortega you know this is day one of your acting career <laughs> and no pressure no pressure but it was one of the those moments you know because we 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 worked with it i'm so hard and was this going to be the test moment we got him out there and he just nailed it and it was great i mean um, jenna was talking to a disembodied hand and with a guy in a blue suit attached to it and it was all working uh it was it was very satisfying gotta tell you um 
and his aesthetic i mean he's he's a bit of a mystery i my understanding is tim actually had some sketches uh for him uh was that the design to have scars and we don't really know like where he comes from exactly no we don't but who knows if the show goes long enough maybe we will that would be great um but right now well, right now he's a mystery and that's what they it's stated in the show so uh you know Jenna, Jenna says he's, he's the big Adams family mystery. So I, I think at some point in the distant future, there is probably a setup for that, uh, telling that backstory. I would love that. Um, I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about Nevermore Academy and, and how you work with production design? Uh, because that has to be some sort of close collaboration, I would imagine, in terms of making it look so seamless from what you start with and what sort of effects you have to weave into wherever that location is in Romania. Yeah. Well, it's actually, the, it's it's uh, out in the mountains. It's in the uh, Carpathian Mountains there. It's actually surrounded by beautiful rocky cliffs with snow on top and all this business. It's actually a ski resort. And we couldn't show any of that because it needs to look like Vermont. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, th th that... It's called Canted Casino Castle. It's not really a castle. It looks much more like a villa. It's not very big. It's just a, one main building and sort of some, some surroundings or smaller buildings. There's not much to it there. Uh, Tim was gravi gravitated towards it because he just liked the look of the architecture and he could see that there was potential in it. Um, and then from there, the production designers started doing up sketches as to how we might flesh it out and. Uh, kind of handed it off to us and we built up a model to sort of demonstrate how it worked in shots. And then we went out and shot a bunch of plates of it and um, realized that the design didn't work and went back and redid it um, to, to accommodate what the cameras could actually shoot of, of this place. But yeah, I'd say 20% of it is real uh, and the rest is entirely CG, including the environment around it. Um, and I, I gotta say, I'm pretty happy with how it came out because nobody, Nobody's come up to me and said, you know, look CG. And I, I gotta tell you, in this business, that happens a lot. Well, I was I'm just curious. You want to get to the point where no one says that. <laughs> well, I yeah, I would have never known that. Um, and for someone who's not a visual effects expert like myself, you know, what is what is your process like in terms of are you getting shots daily? Are you getting it at the end and you have to insert it all? I mean what is sort of your timeline in when you're getting the footage and how much of your stuff just gets scrapped with everything else? Well, uh, it, okay, it's it's almost all of what we do there is a very long process. We start it in prep. We have to manage it through production. And, um, you know, as the edits start to come in, we will then start to, you know, Get the shots to vendors and, and get them actually working on real real shots uh so you know the show shot for eight months uh pretty pretty close to eight months uh, the part of that was due to covid issues uh, normally it would be less than that and then after that we had another six months of just finishing shots and i gotta say i don't think that a lot of what we did was was scrapped in any way shape or form um mm. you know there, there was a quite a uh, high level of efficiency on the show. We didn't throw out tons. Uh, you know, there was a few scenes that got trimmed down and some little reordering happened, but pretty much along the lines of what the scripts were and the way the scenes were shot. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind yeah. of what it was. Um, and just in terms of some of the other characters, you know, we've got Hyde who, who trans forms from Tyler and then there's Crackstone we the, the monster at the end um and then Enid who we finally get to see transform into that werewolf what is it who created the designs for those and then what's the most challenging process about us seeing at least Enid and Tyler's characters transform like when we see that on screen it looks like it's it's so natural what's the, what's the most challenging part for you well, from the design point of view, um, the one character that Tim cared about most was the Hyde creature. Um, and he was very, 
very particular about what that would be. And that probably went through the most design iterations as we tried to home in on it. Do you know why um, he cared most about that character? Well, I, I think it's because it's a character that he hadn't really seen before. Hmm. Like he would say like, um, you know, Ina does the werewolf. Okay, we know what werewolves look like. We've seen lots of werewolves. It can be more wolf-like or more man-like or but but you know the, there's a, a large canon of existing werewolves so to him that was just you know get something that we, we like and get it there um but with Hyde, that's a creature that doesn't really exist as as is in any other uh show for so for him that was the unique thing that he could he could work on um and he gave us some very particular design um requirements you know the big googly eyes for one um that they're actually he's somewhat based on uh, there were some uh toys from the uh, 60s i believe called weirdos these okay. kind of crazy looking uh characters with big eyes usually driving ridiculous sort of over overpowered vehicles and things but that that was a large part of the design influence um big daddy raw that kind of that kind of stuff um, and, you know, there was a lot of iterations of that and it wasn't getting there. And finally, Tim did a little sketch of it, pen and ink, something like this. And immediately, you know, the, the concept people got it. And, and that's, that's kind of where that settled. Um, the challenges on those types of creatures is, I think you're, you're quite right. It's in the transformations. Because once you have a creature, you kind of know what you can do with it. You know, you can figure out its parameters, how far it can reach, how fast it can run. There's a, sort of a whole set of things that you can just sort of work through. But the transformations are always, what is that going to look like? Um, you know, you got somebody who's this size and has to be this size. Um, how do you get through that? And in all honesty, most of that was solved in post-production. Because I know we kind of got it partially solved in production but it was just not completely there. So in post, we kind of went in and you know started to identify, let's do this and do that, build it up. We also very deliberately took the, because the whole, the whole show uh, borrows from uh, B movies, Adam's Family, original uh, sort of stuff as well. It, it's, it's not meant to feel like a modern uh, incarnation of it completely. It should always harken back to that stuff and so we very deliberately took the approach of breaking up those those transitions into pieces so it felt a little bit like american werewolf in london you know it's not like one big transformation on screen um because that's just not what we're doing so we focused in on let's do this let's do this and we we kind of put it all together that way uh, but there's a lot of uh yeah a lot of little cheats and tricks going on in those transformations um a lot <laughs> Speaking of like cheats and, and tricks, what are the visual effects that aren't obvious? I mean, we know, we, we can see with the monsters, we know that's visual effects, but what are some of the things that the audience might not know are visual effects that are some of your favorites about the series? Yeah, well, there there, there is one shot in particular that I think was very successful and was quite difficult to do. And it's it's very much along the lines of a Penn and Teller routine where, you know, go on stage and lights a cigarette, but what's really going on is all of these other things. And you look at the shot and you go, hey, that looked like an ordinary shot. It's a fine shot, but what's the big deal? But there was so much visual effects work going into it. And I can't tell you what any of it is. Oh, it's a <laughs> secret. You're keeping it a secret. I'm keeping that one a secret, yes. But yes, I think that's probably the finest shot in the show. And I can never really tell anybody. Why? Uh, because it was just sort of, you know, it was not meant to be a shot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I won't harass you about it anymore. Um, if you had to choose one character, scene, or episode, what was the most challenging? Um, you know, um, I, I would actually say it's a, it's, a, it's a sequence that doesn't get that much attention. Um, but it's the um, kind of in the episode two, it's called the Poka. Okay. Um, we had to do all this... Um, um, siren underwater work and um, a lot of sort of uh, putting that sequence together to make it make it really work 
And it was quite difficult to do. Um, and the shooting of it was difficult. We had to get our actor uh, and the stunt team trained him up to work underwater because I kind of insisted we shoot underwater for this material. And um, so, yeah, we had this guy in a wave tank for, in a water tank for several days. And, uh, you know, he did really well. Uh, didn't complain. You know, he's sitting, we, we had him in like a, a, a pencil skirt. So his legs were together and we gave him a big mono fin so he could sort of swim sort of mermaid-like. And he just did that for endlessly, and he loved it. And so it, it was it was a whole challenging bit of business to bring all that together and to execute it and to take it into post. And honestly, it's probably uh, I think the most complicated sequence in the show. And, I know uh, that you're involved throughout the whole process and post production, but what's it like for you when you see the final edit when when you see it on Netflix? You know, what's that like for you to see it all come together? And, and what are you the most proud about with this series? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the show was incredibly well received. So it's it's been very satisfying to, to work on something that's that popular, that it's almost everybody I know has seen it yeah, uh, and, and, and loved it. So it really kind of hit a chord. So that's been tremendously satisfying. I, I think to me, the biggest success on the show is thing came across as uh, this fleshed out real character. Um, you know, we, 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 we took what had been done in the 90s and we took it further and we had better technology and, and, and on our side. And I think we, we basically took what they did and just took it to another level. And, you know, things, things success, is, it's partly the writing. It's a lot of it is Victor's performance. Um, he really, he really worked on it and, and, and nailed it. But a lot of it is also, you know, visual effects supporting it and, you know, working the shots in post-production. If something was wrong with it, you know, we'd go in and fix it. Uh, there's a few shots in there that I think are still a little bit flawed. It could be better, but honestly, I think we kind of took that character and, you know, made it in. He, he's like the second most popular character in the show. <laughs> and that's very satisfying to have been part of that. At what age did you know you wanted to be a visual effects artist? And what were some of the films that inspired you? Or TV shows? Yeah. Well, okay. So, I mean, my first interest in visual effects, I was maybe 15. Okay. And, you know, it was, I, I, it was doing, you know, things on Super 8 in the backyard uh, with, with my friends. And, you know, we would, we would, we would, do our best to come up with visual effects and, and, and things like that. I mean, my influences at the time were, well, 2001 was a big influence on me, but so was Star Wars. I mean, you know, I'm, I was there opening night in Vancouver. Um, and, you know, back in those days, you, you wanted to see the movie again, you went back to the theater. So, you know, I, I went back to the theater and paid my, paid my fare 10 times <laughs> to, to, to see that movie. And, um, you know, Close Encounters, movies of that sort of nature uh, at that time had, had a big influence on me. And then I kind of, you know, decided, didn't, didn't really think that this was a viable career option. I mean, it seems kind of silly to want to be a visual effects person. Um, so I ended up going down the more traditional filmmaking route. I learned camera, went through the camera department as a camera assistant and, and that sort of business. And then along came 1990, and that's when sort of the photo mechanical way of doing things uh was 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 pretty much at the peak that it was ever at but at the same time digital was coming on board and so there was a, a watershed moment there and that i kind of had just the right tool set at the right time i had first of all i knew about visual effects as a kid because i'd actually read pretty much everything i could find on the subject i um uh, I had a camera background, so I knew how cameras worked. And, and at that time, a lot of people coming to CG had no idea. Um, so that was an advantage to me. And then also, I'd done computer science in university. And, and so I kind of had a really strong set of, of, of skills at just at the right time, just as that digital world was taking off. So, I mean, I've been, I've been pretty much doing it professionally since around 1990. Uh, and I'm 
pretty much never been really unemployed since. Wow. And that has to be, it has to be one of the professions in film that you have to really just keep learning and learning because the technology has changed so much. And you're the perfect person to speak to that as someone who's been doing this since for decades. Yeah. Is that one of the biggest challenges is just to keep up with the technology? Uh, well, you know, the, the technology, it, it, it moves fast, but it's not that fast. You can kind of keep up with, with what the changes are, um, you know, and we're not at the end of the curve yet. Um, it's not, not really leveling out. It's still very much climbing. And I guess the next big thing is what is AI going to do to visual effects? And I don't know who, anybody that really has an answer to that yet, other than it's going to do big things. Uh, it's going to be very, very different world. And it's going to probably be, you know, the same difference that we saw from going from traditional mechanical effects to digital. Now we're going to be going into another realm. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely been a career where when I started out, it was all about invention because the, the, nothing, nothing really existed. You wanted to do something, you had to build it. Um, and you had to think of a way to, to solve a problem. And over time, you know, the processes have become more standardized and, and stabilized um, and more organized. And, and the size of the industry from 1990 to now, it's, I don't know, 100 times bigger, <laughs> probably in that range. Um, and there's still things to learn every day. So it, it you, you just, it's continuous. It's different now. You learn different things, uh, different ways of working, but uh, it's still a learning curve and it's ongoing. Well, Tom, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you about Wednesday. It's incredible work. Best of luck to you and the entire cast and crew at the upcoming Emmys. And thanks for speaking with Gold Derby today. Yes, and I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thank you very much.